Bring hand up. Hey, Corso. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Webinar series kindly co-organized with the Public Health Network Comrade. Um, my name is Mariana and um, as I can see, people are still joining. Um, I'll just go through some housekeeping before I introduce the team. I hope everybody hears me well. Um, everybody obviously's camera's off, but I... Oh, somebody can't hear. Um, Okay, so some some people can hear and some can't. So I'll leave it to the technical team. Um, I'll leave it to the team to to sort of um, um, sort out if uh, some people can't hear. Um, Croiso, welcome again. Um, in terms of housekeeping, after the presentations, there will be a chance um, uh, for everyone to ask questions, and you can already post your reflections and questions in the chat. Um, please uh, use the chat. Um, uh, because there isn't, uh, it's, it's already, everybody's muted. Uh, use the chat throughout the webinar. Uh, we welcome both English and Welsh contributions. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Public Health um, Network Comrades website after the session. Um, again, if you experience any difficulties with the technology, you can't hear anything else, please let, um, uh, let the organisers, let the team know uh, through the chat. Uh, and they will um, they will hopefully sort it out for you. Um, to let you know, there will be a comfort break um, in about uh, an hour, maybe an hour and a half time, around two thirty. So don't worry, you'll have a, a some time to um, uh, sort of uh, relax and and grab a cup of tea and coffee. And we'll try to keep to time and finish uh, on time. So I uh, hopefully most of those who uh, want uh, to join and listen uh, to the uh, to this webinar have joined now. So just start with a brief introduction. Um, as I said, my name is uh, Mariana and I'll be the facilitator for the masterclass today. Um, I'm a consultant in public health and uh, an international health lead at Public Health Wales and also a deputy director of our WHO Collaborating Centre on Investment for Health and Wellbeing. Um, I have um, extensive sort of more than 20 years, I shouldn't say that, uh, experience uh, and practice, um, uh, including medicine, uh, public health policy and practice and uh, um, academic research work as well. Uh, largely in the area of um, um, health um, uh, promotion, promotion, disease prevention, and also making and strengthening the case um, uh, for uh, shifting spend and investment uh, to um, prevention and public health and health and well-being, working closely with the World Health Organization and with other international partners and across different countries. So, um, as part of the team today, we have Kath Ashton and Anna Stilke, and we have our um, social value expert, um, um, Oliver Kempton. Um, Oliver Kempton I'll present um, just after the um, uh, comfort break because he'll be speaking then. And um, I'll just to introduce Kath and Anna now. So um, Kath is an experienced researcher and a program manager uh, currently um, uh, of the social value uh, program at uh, the Collaborating Centre. She's been with Public Health Wales since uh, 2012 and she has an interest in developing uh, the social return investment framework to use within public health. And uh, Anna uh, has been with us uh, since 2016, and she's an international evidence development officer uh, currently focusing on social value and well-being economy to understand how to redesign the economy um, so that serves people uh, and the planet over profit. And she's recently uh, took a secondment uh, together, uh, worked with the World Health Organization um, Office for Investment for Health and Development uh, in Venice. Um, so um, why uh, why <laughs> have we organized uh, and uh, uh, first of all, uh, so I don't forget at the end to thank um, uh, the Public Health Network Comre uh, for helping us uh, to gather you all and uh, and organize this um, uh, this masterclass, this webinar. Um, why do we uh, we wanted to do that uh, and uh, I believe this is the first of its kind. Uh, um, 
session really, a webinar um, looking into uh, uh, looking into and providing an insight and some tools of how to capture and measure what matters, uh, not necessarily what is easy, but what matters to people and also what would make the most difference to our communities, um, to um, our NHS, to our National Health Service in Wales, uh, to the economy and to our living environment. So this is uh, what we uh, are going to um, um, discuss today and uh, um, show you and provide a bit of a, a, a bit more of an uh, uh, going a little bit more in depth into the how, not only the what, uh, into the social value. I mean, you can call it also public value or well-being impact um, of specifically public health. And I'm saying this is probably the first of its kind because it sort of uh, tailors and aligns the uh, the methodology behind um, measuring and capturing social value to public health services and interventions. So it's very relevant, obviously, uh, to public health colleagues um, across the system, uh, but also to other um, uh, practitioners and other uh, uh, colleagues uh, and uh, professionals who are interested in improving population health and uh, well-being, uh, reducing inequalities and uh, achieving um, uh, well-being for the people in Wales, but also internationally, as I said, we work quite a lot uh, internationally. So um, hopefully we'll be able to achieve these um, through um, uh, some more general, but also some more technical um, uh, information and we'll also have time um, for uh, a bit of a discussion, for questions, reflections, uh, some uh, menti, some uh, menti uh, questions for you to answer. Because of the size of the group, uh, we wanted to do well. We wanted to do some of um, uh, some uh, uh, group um, group working, but unfortunately, because of the size, this won't be possible online. And we very much wanted to do this uh, masterclass in person, which again, due to uh, financial constraints, um, uh, uh, wasn't possible, unfortunately. But we very much hope that this uh, just um, uh, is the start. So it's a it's a. Um, the first um, um, uh, webinar and masterclass of a series, we hope, where we can then maybe look a bit more in depth into the different areas, whether it's public health, whether it's uh, financing um, health, uh, population health, uh, whether it's working maybe with partners and uh, researchers and the third sector or the private sector, whether it's looking how it contributes to the foundational economy. So there are various aspects of um, of uh, where uh, we can apply the social value uh, uh, concept and the methodology behind it uh, and um, uh, hopefully uh, be able to help and contribute to developing and building a more uh, sustainable and resilient um, NHS. So stop with the, the sort of a overview um, here and we very much hope that um, um, you'll enjoy uh, and you'll be interested and uh, we're very open to follow up um, afterwards and see um, uh, uh, and organize more of these either online and hopefully more in person going forward. So um, I will just provide um, a bit of a um, context and the drivers around uh, this agenda. Thank you, Kath. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is related, as uh, uh, all of you probably know, uh, very much to global uh, as well as uh, uh, national challenges. So challenges related to um, our transition out of the COVID pandemic and the long term consequences of that, uh, exacerbating, for example, um, uh, health and socioeconomic inequalities. Um, uh, the consequences of Brexit are uh, still very visible. Uh, global risks and threat related to uh, war and uh, economic crisis and rising cost of living. Uh, we are witnessing um, in Wales and across uh, uh, the UK um, uh, aging population, but not necessarily. So we're talking about um, aging, but unhealthy aging, so to say. So um, increasing the number of people who are older, but having also multiple mor morbidities, so increasing the burden of disease, um, as well as um, young people uh, and challenges in terms of their mental health and well-being and um, inclusion, social inclusion and inclusion in the labour market. So um, all of these sort of uh, uh, climate change, of course, as our biggest global threat currently. So all of that um, 
is uh, is a very uh, uh, creates um, uh, um, it is a, a threat and a challenge, but at the same time there is a, a it creates a, a window of opportunity. As we know, um, uh, we are oh, 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 usually usually changes uh, uh, happen. Um, uh, happen in the in the times of uh, of crisis or crisis sort of um, um, uh, instigate uh, instigate uh, change hopefully positive change um, and I've listed a couple of other things in relation to evidence and uh, innovation and this is these are both challenges and opportunities and in terms of evidence for example um, we for example um, considering there is quite a lot of evidence out there already and data and we consider ourselves data rich but are we really and in the problems we would like to address, like inequalities, do we have disaggregated data? Do we have local level data? So um, it is both a challenge, but also a strength. Do we use the data and the evidence we have um, as we should be doing and build on that? And also, uh, do we measure um, uh, the right things? Do we measure only the easy, the, the things which can be easily measured? Or we also um, uh, want to measure the things which uh, are important and matter to, to people and, uh, and uh, a sustainable system. Um, innovation, uh, we talk a lot about new technologies and artificial intelligence. But do we consider also social innovation, transformation, integration of services as well? Um, of course, these are priorities for Welsh Government and we work closely with them and trying to support uh, this drive in Wales, uh, which of course we have the political context I'll mention a bit later, uh, but also we want uh, to see it also implemented uh, on the ground. So of course is this challenge of balancing the immediate uh, and pressures on the NHS created post-COVID um, long waiting lists and, and, and uh, uh, acute pressures with a sort of long-term sustainability. Um, next slide. Um, I've mentioned uh, briefly some of the opportunities already, uh, for example, well-being economy, and there is a, a global uh, drive. And also in Wales, it's very clear the commitment of a well-being economy, which positions people and their well-being, uh, social well-being, uh, planetary well-being uh, up front uh, uh, to uh, 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 not necessarily and sort of shaping development as an important uh, uh, or leading factor for shaping, shaping and and uh, um, uh, uh, and progressing development, not only uh, uh, gross, you know, domestic product GDP, and not only uh, uh, profit. Um, so, uh, of course, the well-being of future generations is a, is a clear, uh, um, uh, it's a legislation, it's a clear commitment to that, as well as uh, the foundational economy in Wales. Uh, the opportunity in this sort of crisis times and. Um, a perma crisis to shift uh, spending and budgets towards prevention and early intervention and to base our services on value uh, in order to create uh, uh, systems which create actually uh, health and well-being rather than our or only reactive and our uh, illness systems rather than, than health systems. Next uh, slide. Um, so uh, there is quite a bit of an alignment and over the last um, eight years as a WHO collaborating centre, we have been working closely uh, with partners uh, uh, across the NHS, uh, wider Wales, um, with Welsh Government, with the World Health Organisation, with other global partners, with other public health institutes and countries um, uh, to see how uh, we can make the best of uh, the positive uh, political context and, and uh, uh, international and national drivers as the um, uh, 20 U United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, the WHO um, uh, Programme of Work uh, and the European uh, uh, Programme of Work as well and priorities. Um, better health, you know, provide to provide better health for everyone, leaving no one behind. Um, as well as the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales and uh, um, the socio-economic duty, our um, uh, health and social care strategy, Healthier Wales and the Healthier Wales Foundational Economy Programme. We uh, have enabled a memorandum of understanding between uh, the WHO and the uh, Welsh Government, very much focusing on reducing health inequalities and um, uh, helping to uh, build and progress this well-being economy we have been talking about. And we feel and think that um, uh, and a, a lot of this work around um, 
capturing and measuring a social value, which of course you'll learn more about what it means. It's a comprehensive concept of value. So it's not only social, it's also economic and environmental. It's what matters to people really. So capturing that uh, hopefully can help um, um, spending and investment uh, prioritization and, uh, um, uh, and providing additional uh, and important evidence uh, to complement our strong value-based healthcare um, uh, in, in Wales and create a sort of a value-based public health um, approach uh, um, as well. So next slide. Um, so it's just mentioning that as uh, an organization, Public Health Wales is very much committed to this um, um, approach uh, to go beyond the value for money. So we have started this work already before COVID. It has been heavily disrupted with COVID, of course, but working together with colleagues across um, uh, across different directors, with our finance colleagues, with our planning and performance colleagues, with colleagues across uh, knowledge and research and evaluation as well, uh, and trying to link all of these elements around evaluating public health services interventions around performance you know uh, creating you know indicators for per performance uh, looking into impact uh, and very much going beyond the value for money only but into more uh, public health and co-benefits as we say co-benefits uh, not only related to health but also to wider well-being societal community well-being uh, planetary and and economic um, as well so this is where our program of work started as, as an extended balance sheet, which had then transitioned into a more broader sort of conceptually sort of value based public health. Next one. And we're very much taking, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Hopefully you know uh, us or if you don't, happy to follow up. Uh, so um, we very much progressing this work uh, uh, with colleagues from the uh, WHO Collaborating Centre, which is uh, the Policy and International Health Directorate at Public Health Wales. And our really main um, sort of ambition and all the work is related to how to strengthen uh, uh, the, the, the investment case for, for prevention and public health. Um, I think I'll stop here and I'll hand over uh, to uh, my uh, uh, experienced colleague and program manager Karth, um, who will take you through the concept of uh, value and social value. Thank you, Karth. Brilliant. Thank you, Mariana. I assume you can see me and hear me. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Um, OK, thank you all for attending today. Um, and thanks, Mariana, for giving that um, overview of the context and why we're doing the work here in Public Health Wales. So I'm going to take it back to basics a bit and talk through some of the, the concepts that we're talking we're going to be talking about today in this session. So I'm going to start off by looking at what what is value? What do we mean by value? So. Whenever we have previously asked this question in sessions such as this, we have had such a range of responses, which tells us there is no single straightforward definition of what we mean by value. So I've got a few examples on, on the slides here from some of the different responses we've got. And you can just see from this the differences in, in people's thinking. So, for example, someone reported they thought value was how worthwhile something is in terms of cost and personal appreciation. One person put just simply that they think value is that the benefits are greater than the financial input for example an intervention someone mentioned just how useful or something or or good something is um and another person reported about you know they think value is about talking to those service users and understanding what matters to them another response we had was that value is a positive outcome for individual and society and someone else just put cost effective quality that's what they understand value to be so you can see from this that there is a range of definitions and concepts and definitions around what people think value means. So if we look back historically, definitions of value have focused on monetary worth. So, you know, what can I get back in my pocket, basically, for investing some money or the ability to do some more with fewer resources? So that that basically means a simple ratio of, you know, if you put cost into something, what are the outcomes? What do I get back and what do I get back in my pocket? But nowadays, the focus has shifted slightly away from that, that definition of value to uh, from simply a cost cutting exercise. So instead of just focusing on those costs and returns, broader definitions have come into fruition um, and they've been proposed that consider value from multiple different perspectives. 
So one of these examples um, is the, exam uh, the definition given by the expert panel on effective ways of investing in health in 2019. And they proposed a concept of value built on four different pillars. Um, and this, um, for those in the room who work within value-based healthcare, is commonly known as value-based healthcare. So they propose four value pillars, and these are allocative value, technical value, personal value, and society, societal value. So what do we mean by these? Um, so firstly, allocative value. So this is the equity. Equ equitable distribution of resources across all patients or service user groups. So looking at through that lens, you can also look at value through a technical value lens. So looking at the achievement of best po possible outcomes with the available resources that you've got. There's also an aspect of personal value. So what is the appropriate care to achieve patients or service users personal goals? And then finally, there's that societal value, which is looking through the lens of the contribution of healthcare to social participation and connectedness. So looking at those wider societal factors rather than just looking at the impact on the individual. When we also talk about value, we can consider it from three different angles. So firstly, when we're thinking about, you know, what value does our programme or intervention create? We need to think about the costs that we're putting into the programme, and the outcomes that we expect or we can see um, coming through through as a result of the program. The second thing that we also need to consider is those different perspectives. So when you invest in a program, those outcomes are going to be experienced differently by all different types of stakeholder groups. So and that depends on their needs. So they'll have a dis different perspective of what that personal value could be, what that societal value could, could be. So, for example, a service user would have a different sense of value to a funder or an investor in a programme or even to the wider community. And thirdly, um, you can look at value from the scope. So these are the different types of programmes or interventions that you're looking to assess the value of. So the scope of that intervention will be different for every single intervention or programme you're looking at. So it's important to consider these three factors when we're thinking about value. So moving on to social value then I'll do the same with this concept you know talk through what we think the definitions could be how do we think it be measured and capture five different areas which we think are important to consider when you're looking to capture or measure social value first one being the drivers of social value so why why are you looking to capture or measure social value who or what is creating the social value who or what is impacted so which stake stakeholder groups are affected or experience a change as a, as a result of your action what is the nature of the impact and how then can the impact be measured? So I'll go through each one of these now individually. Sorry, there we go. So the first one is the drivers of social value. So there are several reasons why organisations may use social value or try and capture social value. So, for example, this could be to demonstrate how the services they are going to buy or contract can secure wider benefits to the area or stakeholders. So this is looking at it through a commissioning or procurement lens. There's also um, to attract funding and demonstrate value for money. So this could build the case for investment. So that's why you'd want to capture the social value of an activity you're doing. There's also about highlighting the good work an organisation may be doing for the public or maybe so social value is central to their mission. So this could be the third sector or charity organisations. But although the reasons for capturing social value may vary and those drivers may vary, demonstrating a positive impact for the economy, society and the environment is a central aim of all of those reasons. Secondly, we've got who or what is creating the social value. So the way in which social value is defined, measured and captured will also vary according to the source of the social value. So several organisations may produce social value in different ways. So, for example, social value can be created through the implementation of policies or processes, um, the action or inaction of organisations uh, through interventions um, and also through individuals um, and also changes in the natural environment that can create social value. So there's different contexts about who or what is creating the social value that's important to consider. The third aspect is who or what is impacted. So this is then thinking about mapping those stakeholder groups that you think may be impacted by a, a programme, a policy or an intervention. So 
the social value may be aimed specifically at a single person, or it may be felt more broadly. So, for example, a stakeholder could be those individuals. So in our scenario, that would be service users or patients. Um, the social value also may be created within communities or within society as a whole. Um, also within the economy and the environment as well. So it's also it's important to consider all these different stakeholder groups when you're looking at the social value that you may have created. Um, the next one then is what is the nature of the impact? So the definition or how you capture the social value will also vary according to the nature of the impact. So for example, um, a policy or program may have some subjective well-being or quality of life outcomes that you could see emerge as a result of, of implementing an intervention. There may also be outcomes experienced by stakeholders around knowledge, skills and employment, the ones around motivation, beliefs, or it may affect individuals' behaviour. So all of these things may affect the social value in different ways in terms of their effect on the individual, but they may also affect the economy if you're keeping people in work or the environment if you're looking at housing development, for example. And finally, how is the impact measured? So social value can be measured in several ways. And um, we've got Oliver Kempton talking later on in the session about using social return on investment as a framework or methodology to capture social value. But we've got some key examples here of how you would want to obtain the information, basically, to be able to say that a programme or policy is creating a certain amount of social value. So this can be done, for example, through quantitative self-reporting. So going out and speaking to stakeholders themselves and getting that information back about what social value may have been created for them. This can also be done through qualitative accounts, so interviews or observations. You can um, collate um, stated or revealed preferences or willingness to pay information from stakeholders about how, how they think a programme or policy has affected, affected them. Or you can also use hard outcomes, for example, existing data to look and map and think how things could have changed over time. And you can also do some direct financial analysis to figure out the social value of a programme that you've implemented. So I think that's it on the context. I'll now talk through a little bit about social value approaches. So the way in which social value is valued can also affect the context in which it is used and defined. So for this, I'm going to talk through. So, for example, if social value is placed at a core of a project, so if you're running an intervention and the emphasis in measurement is usually on the change that is created by the intervention itself, and this in public health is what we would call mapping out a theory of change model. So we can look at what measurable inputs have gone into a service or intervention. So this could be people, resources, money. And then we'd look at what activities are generated from that investment, which and then look at what measurable outputs and then outcomes have come out of that activity. So. Within social value, we tend to then look and focus on those outcomes that have been generated as a result of the activity. So where social impact is at the core of a programme or intervention, measurement of the difference of the change made tends to be done by taking account of the counterfactual measure or by considering the difference between the target population of the intervention and then a control group of a different population. And this would be a gold standard way of capturing that social value of an intervention or programme. But social value may also be placed at the periphery of a project. So this is often seen in some procurement led approaches, for example, as typified by the Social Value Act in England and then the new um, the new Social Partnerships and Public Procurement Act that's coming into Wales in April, I think it is. Um, social, economic or environmental value is seen as an additional benefit of the delivery of a core contract. So this is where the social value is created through a delivery of a contract so it's seen as an additional benefit which would not have been achieved in the absence of the contract and another another potential distinction is that procurement led approaches to social value follow a clearly defined process in relation to tendering and contracting that can include sometimes scoring as a way to assess the proposed social value of different bidders subjectively so there's different ways of thinking about social value in the approach that you take so as Mariana sort of hinted to earlier on, social value is becoming increasingly important to help deliver the most value 
for that direct money back into the pocket, but also the direct value on the economy, on the individuals and also on the environment. So social value can be embedded in procurement and commissioning processes. It can also be embedded in investment and resource or budget prioritisation. And it also can be embedded into assessment and evaluation. The social value in public health. Um, obviously, as we all know, the, co the COVID pandemic has exposed the consequences of under-resourcing of public health and highlighted that clear dependence between population health, societal well-being and the economy. So linking together those wider determinants of health. So the case for targeted investment in people's well-being and health equity is stronger than ever, requiring coherent action across the NHS and other sectors to help maximise that value created and impact of public services and intervention to help build the case for investment in public health. So measuring social value can enable not only public health, but also health organisations to Firstly, understand what really matters to people, patients, families and communities. Capturing social value is a very participatory approach. And as I've said, you map all of your stakeholders at the start and then you, you, you get them involved in trying to capture and measure that. So you can understand what really matters to them as an outcome of what you're trying to achieve. Social, measuring social value can enable us to assess, measure and track those real outcomes and impacts in a systematic and com comprehensive way. It can almost help, almost help with the um, allocation of resources to where they are having the greatest impact on people or specific groups or communities or specific areas within the economy or the environment. Measuring social value can also enable us to invest in those high value upstream interventions. So moving that focus onto primary prevention and early intervention to help protect and improve health and well-being and to reduce those health inequities. It can also help to inform and maximise value for money, quality and wider benefits of services and interventions. So as Mariana alluded to earlier, obviously we've got a work programme within the WHOCC, which, um, which we're starting to call value-based public health, which is a programme of work which applies the social value approach to capturing and measuring that wider holistic value of, of the public health work that we do. So within this work programme, we've got five main key areas or objectives. Um, the first one being to pioneer, promote and raise awareness and enhance implementation on the use of social value methods nationally and internationally. We are aiming to explore evidence and opportunities to develop further the concept, methodology and real life application of social value and social return on investments, SROI. Um, we are piloting and progressing the application of the SRI methodology to assess public health services and interventions because um, there is a lot of evidence to use SRI within particularly third sector organisations. It's coming into the health sector, but we're looking to progress that further into the public health sector as well. Um, we are utilising national and international best practice and experience, and we're looking to help build a systems based approach on evidencing social value within public health. So I think that's all from me for this section, and we are now on to some QA and reflection. So I'll hand over to Mariana. Thanks a lot, Ka. Um, and uh, yes, I hope uh, this has been uh, interesting and generating some questions and reflections from, uh, from the audience. Thank you for going uh, in detail through the different types of and uh, perspectives into looking into the social value. And um, yes, we would like, we'll be very keen to um, explore with uh, yourselves how uh, this concept, and as I said, is the social value because of the social value UK, but I know in Wales, um, it can be called public value, well-being impact, so we're not not that precious about the term, although there are definitions, obviously, and uh, inclusions behind that. Um, but yes, for, for we, we have started working with the social value concept and the social return investment as one of the methodologies. Um, so very much looking forward to explore how we can apply and integrate this better uh, uh, with colleagues across the NHS or, or different other partners um, to really um, so 
um, as Kath has nicely described, and then you'll see a little bit more into detail going forward how um, we can um, uh, value and monetize and show the the financial sort of um, put a tag if you want of the financial um, uh, the financial measure or the financial uh, um, uh, um, um, the financial uh, representation of all of these soft um, outcomes uh, of uh, what matter to people, you know, whether it's related to their mental health and well-being, uh, feeling um, safe, um, trust uh, in communities, um, living, you know, having opportunity for development and, and so on. So I'll just have a look. I know uh, my excellent. Oh, there you go. I have some we have some questions um, already. So we have around uh, uh, 15, maybe um, 20 minutes for uh, um, uh, questions and a discussion and uh, my excellent colleagues from the Public Health Network have uh, already uh, um, shared some of us. So question from Sarah Kapstick, how do you see social value being put into practice with the new health service procurement regime in Wales, which is currently being consulted on? Um, So, I'm not a specialist in procurement. Um, one thing we have been discussing, and uh, I'll ask uh, obviously um, colleagues uh, if they would like to um, share an answer to that. One thing we have been um, uh, discussing a lot is how um, how we can broaden uh, really the utilization of uh, uh, of the social value and the social return investment. Um, well, one element is obviously with procurement, but procurement is is very much leading in everything which is happening in uh, both England and Wales, and we want to take it broader than that. Uh, and uh, include it into uh, program improvement, um, you know, evaluation, uh, uh, budget sort of uh, um, spending sort of decisions and budget prioritization. So I um, uh, I believe again as a as a non as a public health professional and not, not an expert in procurement. Um, we uh, we need to see obviously um, how it's a, it's an interesting uh, question and it's a good suggestion to have a look into how actually so I'm will be very happy to continue to follow up with you Sarah and discuss how um, how this can uh, um, uh, be useful um, I suppose uh, and add on to the uh, this health service procurement uh, uh, regime and the new legislation as uh, Kath has mentioned coming uh, into Wales currently we are aware as Kath has mentioned that uh, procurement through procurement um, uh, um, our colleagues are looking into this um, added value and how uh, you know um, different uh, um, goods and services which are being procured uh, or commissioned um, have this additional sort of co-benefit. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, using the use of social return investment yet into there, but I think um, it's definitely an opportunity to apply the, this concept uh, and the social return investment or other relevant methods into, into this regime and in relation to the new legislation. So I don't know whether Kath or Oliver uh, would like to add anything to that. Yeah, I can jump in. I was thinking whether this relates to um, the wellbeing impacts group that I've been sitting on in Welsh Government. So there, there have been a team of people in Welsh Government looking at, it started off as a social value working group, and they then got changed to the wellbeing impacts working group. So I think they've been brought together. I think it's, it's disconvened now, the group, but they think they've been brought together to sort of think through this and think about how um, the, so the, the well-being impacts can be measured and captured and I think they've pulled together a list of indicators for use going forward um, but you know if you did want to follow up like we can give you the key contacts for that group and maybe you could get in touch with them because they'd have a bit more information to share with you I think. Thank you Kath. Um, I think that probably provides good information. I can't see Oliver chipping in, so I'll just uh, carry on uh, and we can continue, of course, the conversation outside of this webinar. We have a couple of very interesting questions uh, which are linking with other methodologies and one I'll, um, uh, well, I'll um, 
Kath, do you want to answer the second one? So we have a question on Jason from Jason uh, Connie Beer. Is measuring social value the same or a duplication of the well, a Welsh Government health impact assessment regulations which are currently being consulted on? So it's very interesting, actually, and relevant that you're rising, uh, sort of raising this, um, because we have uh, uh, one of the one of the. Uh, part of the work we are doing as part of the social values actually um, they're complementary they're complementary methodologies but I'll I'll hand over to Kath because I know she's been obviously working and we have published um, uh, even a couple of papers around that they are not the same they have similar um, elements but they are actually complementing each other and we have been combining them into evaluating different programs so Kath do you want to say a little bit more on that? Yes, it's interesting that you've brought that up, actually, Jason, because my my role at the moment is split between our health impact assessment unit that we've got in Public Health Wales and the social value team. Um, and we've actually mapped out the similarities, I guess, and the way that um, social return on investment as a way of capturing social value can actually integrate with the health impact assessment process quite nicely. Um, and they benefit both, both each other in, in, in different ways. So I'd say measuring social value is not exactly the same as the the health impact assessment regulations which are currently being consulted on there are similarities in the processes but i think in terms of the consultation itself for the the health impact assessment regulations coming in as part of the public health act they're two two very different things and i'd say there's there's quite a lot of crossover at the moment between a lot of these duties from Welsh Government in terms of the health impact assessment regulations, in terms of the social economic duty, in terms of the social social partnerships and public procurement bill as well. There's 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 a lot of similarities in what the ask is in terms of looking at those wider determinants of health in certain situations, so the economic, the social and environmental. So it it's a bit of a, a map trying to figure out how they all, all fit together. But Jason, I'm happy to send you through some literature that we've produced, um, but also to have a further conversation with you outside of this, if, you, if you'd like. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Kath. Um, that's really helpful, and I agree. So we have um, it's um, uh, it's an um, uh, so the well-being of future generations act is obviously is an umbrella to a lot of other legislation regulation, which is going um, uh, more or less in the same direction. And in in this respect, of course, we have the public service boards and then the regional. Um, partnership boards uh, and so there, there is complementary functions but yeah this is one of the one of the opportunities I suppose going forward is how do we um, how do we avoid duplication and um, how do we ma maximize the benefits through these methodologies maybe combining them and and using data available data uh, and evidence um, if one is done to the other and then inform uh, and put a tag may again the, the main of course um, benefit of doing a mass ROI is putting this financial um a financial representation which you'll see into the the second uh, part of the uh, the master class a couple of more questions and a reflection we have um so there is a very interesting uh, question are there examples uh, from Lisa Williams, are there examples of um, uh, SORI and realist um, research evaluation methodology used for evaluation of public health interventions in Wales? I'm not aware. Um, and I know realist um, uh, evaluation has been done quite a lot uh, into evaluating because public health interventions are complex. So it's been done actually to evaluate healthy cities and, uh, you know, health and all policies uh, sort of interventions. Uh, but it's a very good, uh, I would say, suggestion and it's a very, a very interesting so I'll be happy if you want to follow up on that and uh, maybe we can see. But yeah, it's a very good suggestion. I'm not aware, I don't know whether Kath or Oliver maybe will be, might be aware of, of any examples of that. I'm personally not aware, but I think it's a very, very good opportunity to explore how SRI can contribute to a realist um, uh, evaluation. Um, I can't see a hand from or, or Kath or, and Oliver coming up. So, Oliver, do you want to say anything on that? We can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Oh, we still can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so while Oli's, I don't know whether uh, maybe from the colleague from the network, um, Comrade, have muted you. Is that any better now? Yes. Yes. Thank Good you. stuff. Okay. 
Yeah, just briefly on on that point. So I think it's a really interesting one. I think um, we're going to, I think, touch later on SVDS um, and some of the kind of, well, as as Graham's just put on there, there are examples of, of SRI studies and public health on there. Um, I don't have to hand the kind of breakdown by region and so on. Um, but of course, we've been looking within public health Wales at some in a Welsh context. And also the I mean, there, we don't have time to go into this, I think, but in many ways, SROI dr does draw on the realist evaluation um, principles and ethos as well. So it's very much kind of connected to that, I think. Thanks a lot, Oliver. And apologies if I misunderstood. So, yes, there are examples of SROI of public health interventions in Wales, indeed, uh, as well as um, uh, as in England. Um, uh, my understanding has been more is there a combination but obviously you've uh, you've touched on that as well uh, and i think it will be a good opportunity to see how more actually this can be paired i suppose similarly with the hia uh, and the last question we have is um in wales is the private sector embracing social value approach yet or is it mainly in the public sector um again i'll probably leave more of this to uh, to Oli. um um I, from my knowledge, I know public private private sector is actually utilizing social value and social return investment quite a lot. I'm not quite sure whether it's specifically in Wales um, or um, uh, just broader the UK. But Oli, I can see you're nodding, and uh, I'll be happy if you want to answer. Yeah, I think these days social value approaches are actually used more in the private sector in so much as organisations are bidding for contracts and having to talk about social value in that. And I, I know the, the Welsh context is slightly different from the English context, but it kind of applies it in both cases. So so any big any organisation bidding for big public sector contracts will be talking about social value now and the bigger ones have social value teams and so on. That's not necessarily the same as doing a whole social return on investment. And Kath talked about the differences a little bit earlier. I think even within the in, in the health and the public health realm, often organisations, again, that are not necessarily public sector, but maybe are, are charities or social enterprises are, are thinking about social value much more, again, because, because of their relationship with the public sector. So I would say that, um, so yes, it's embracing social value, particularly those parts of the private sector that have the public sector as a major stakeholder. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, that's great. Uh, and we have a reflection from Debbie Schaffer, which um, uh, is related to a specific sort of um, a population or service. So I'll read this out. Uh, and it's an interesting uh, reflection. So I will welcome maybe uh, also some um, uh, responses in uh, in the chat um, as well. It can be incredibly difficult to make the case for allocation of resources um, for an intervention when its impact or value only affects a specific population. On a, for example, menstrual health conditions, um, uh, particularly endometriosis, is a major health burden to patients, services economy, but are historically neglected for a whole ho uh, for a whole. A um, uh, host of reasons, uh, not least because they are not preventable uh, on an individual basis. For these patients, prevention might constitute more and more accessible NHS services, but this doesn't uh, coalesce with direction of travel, their personal responsibility and service um, rationalization. Uh, curious for the thoughts on this chain challenge. So um, I don't know whether Oliver or Kath or um, Anna has any reflection on this i um i agree that uh, for more specific um, prog problems problems and maybe services which are um uh, relatively uh, so limited to uh, maybe a specific population group and there are size issues i actually wanted to mention initially um uh, of course in wales uh, we are uh, quite small and of course um some of these problems um, you know comparatively they become you know this group of uh, patients or population are even even smaller so i can see uh, i can see the challenge um, of course, uh, we uh, the work we are particularly interested uh, sort of working is in relation to more population perspective and public health um, uh, uh, and prevention. And I can see what you're saying in terms of not being preventable on an individual level. But is there um, uh, actually uh, a public health aspect into that? 
and would uh, uh, an impact on the wider determinants um, or any sort of uh, behavioural change potentially um, earlier in life may be able to uh, have an impact on that. I mean, not necessarily maybe endometriosis, but sub sub similar um, conditions uh, which might be uh, challenging uh, in terms of uh, this uh, value and impact evaluation. So I can I can see your point it is a challenge and um, some uh, some of the more uh, clinical aspects, um, uh, of course, um, it's interesting because some of the more clinical aspects, they could have um, uh, quite uh, a lot of uh, studies around uh, cost benefit analysis and uh, return on investment, not necessarily social return on investment. And some of these services are clearly bringing also uh, financial returns and some of these maybe not. So um, again, it's a, it's a matter of um, um, uh, maybe a case on uh, case by case basis of where the social aspect and monetizing this social value and social uh, impact um, uh, is is um, uh, relevant and appropriate and has its place. Uh, I can see Katha coming up. Katha, you want to say anything more on that? Yeah, I was I was just going to comment where I think this is a scenario where using something like social return on investment comes into its own because it doesn't just look at those direct financial back in the pocket type outcomes it's looking at that wider effect that you know helping someone with these conditions can you know get them back into work what impact would that have on the fam on their family so it's looking at that wider impact that by delivering this service would achieve and it's interesting because one of the examples that I'm going to be talking about later is a, a study that we've recently um, carried out which uses both HIA and SROI to look at the um, social value created in a certain prison population with regards to sexual health testing. So that's a very, very niche, small population. But by doing the study, we've been able to demonstrate that of the wider value that programmes like that can create for these small groups. So I think I think things like this do help actually to build the case for investment in, in these niche targeted programmes. Exactly. Thank you very much, Kath. Oliver? No, nothing to anything to add. I think Kath has set it up, yeah. Yes, brilliant. Yes. Well, that's the point. I mean, if there isn't enough investment, so this is this is definitely uh, one of the other benefits is uh, and as you'll show in afterwards, how much more actually from a financial perspective this can be uh, the the this can be proved so that the benefit or the co-benefits and the added value or the whole uh, overall value can actually can actually show um uh, can be uh, expanded uh, and trying to to capture these sort of soft outcomes which are usually not captured so i think uh, we'll wrap it up here uh and uh, i can't see any further uh, questions or um um, or uh, uh, immediate reflections, and you'll have the opportunity. So just to keep posting and uh, in the chat, and we'll have some time at the end as well to look at these. So we have a, a, some interactive session now, uh, who my colleague uh, will be doing together with my colleague Anna, and it's on Mentimeter. Um, so uh, and we have a few questions where we would like to um, uh, gauge your um, uh, your views and uh, your uh, thoughts, uh, even sort of most immediate um, around uh, the social value. So if we can have the next slide where we have the menti, um, the menti. Um, um, yes, thank you, Kath. Um, so if you can join on your phones or computers, doesn't matter, at the menti.com. Um, hopefully most of you are familiar, uh, if not with that, with similar sort of platforms. There is a user code 45166956 uh, uh, or just scan the QR code. And um, uh, then uh, uh, my colleague Anna will post some questions and we can look uh, together into into uh, uh, some of these um, answers. Uh, we have currently, I can see around 80 um, uh, colleagues on the on the call. So we are expecting around uh, or just about uh, 80 uh, responses or maybe without us, maybe around uh, 75 uh, without uh, the team and the presenters. Um, so. Um, I'll just uh, leave um, uh, a little bit of time if you can, everyone can um, can scan the barcode and join um, the the Menti. Um, I think hopefully you had enough time. And Anna, would you like to 
then start it and we can have the first question then uh, visible. Uh, I can ask maybe if um, somebody from the maybe cast, um, if you don't mind um, sharing the the code again in the in the um, in the chat for those who haven't. Oh, actually, the code is there already. So uh, the first question is: What does social value mean to you? Uh, and we can already see uh, the responses. Um, for those who haven't joined yet, there is the code there on, on menti.com. Uh, so, brief responses, people in society making lives better, measuring the wider value created by an intervention or just the cost benefit. Future generations, yes, so very much a, a long term sustainability, very, uh, uh, very good. Wider benefits to society, uh, measuring across social, economic, and environmental well being, positive impact to people's lives, gives extra support for investment in public health. A way of valuing benefits and impact beyond money, measuring wider value, links to well-being of future generations. Definitely uh, mentioned that already. When the ROI goes, oh, I can't follow all of these. I don't know, Anna, whether we have a way to sort of <laughs> going up and down on this list or just coming up. It's fine. We'll be able to maybe. Um, so this, um, I know the results from that. Uh, we are able to save that. And then we can add it to the presentation on the Public Health Network Cymru uh, website. And also will be, um, yeah, so this will be available. Uh, and we also look into these benefits to wider society, project business work, added benefit to populations measured by the popul by that population, violating the wider impact of interventions, community and place-based value measuring the value and impact of intervention. So, yes, uh, I mean, um, obviously the foundational economy, um, uh, the uh, Healthier Wales foundational economy is um, placing um, um, uh, importance on three priorities, um, people, place and procurement. So it does link with that as well. Um, added value, developing benefits for public health measuring. I can see around 60 responses. So I think uh, if there isn't anything um, else coming up, we'll probably we can wrap it up um, here and go to the next question then. Thank you, everyone. What do you think are the benefits of capturing um, social value? According again, this is largely from your perspective and where you're working and the services and uh, and uh, um, uh, departments you are um, obviously uh, um, working in and the areas. Um, uh, you are progressing. Um, so uh, we can see responses starting to come up. Investment in heart from others. Um, I'm not quite sure what heart means, but maybe winning hearts and minds. <laughs> I don't know. But yes, I mean, part of this is really to, um, I mean, as, as Kath has uh, nicely described, is, is exactly where uh, the financial returns or the direct financial returns measured through um, maybe um, savings in terms of uh, saving costs in terms of uh, um, GP or secondary care appointments and, you know, um, are not that um, explicit and visible, but obviously uh, uh, they are wider, uh, but very important co-benefits. Let's see what uh, comes up. Ensure interventions are successful, actually improving people's lives. Yes, for it's definitely um, a quality improvement and uh, and program improvement uh, can also. So maybe again comparing how um, the social return investment um, into uh, maybe other settings or or countries. Um, uh, and why maybe we, we don't have uh, such um, uh, results uh, as elsewhere. Uh, what is it due to? Right places. Yes, the locative efficiency. Actions can be directed to where needed. Yes, uh, definitely cost savings and making efficient use of people and resources. Priorities influence uh, constrained uh, resource allocations. Well, they're always constrained, but even more so now. Uh, are always constrained again. Um, 
but currently, as uh, we all know, uh, the pressures are uh, exceptional, uh, demonstrating impact and affecting change, cross-cutting measurement of what matters long term, getting a more complete understanding value implement intervention, quantifies uh, unquantifiable, yes, exactly, the soft outcomes, which are really difficult. So, of course, there are limitations and challenges to that, which uh, colleagues will look into, it, into this um, a little bit later. But at the end of the day, um, uh, there is, of course, we do need to try and attempt to um, um, to include and be more inclusive rather than just uh, don't measure what uh, we think can't be measured or is difficult to be measured. Developing common metrics across public health bodies, that's very interesting. Getting a complete picture of why the benefits, environmental benefits. There are only 44 responses. I can't see anything coming up, so maybe we can we can say that people are, are happy with these responses and maybe move on to the next question, um, Anna. So the next question is, what do you think are the barriers or challenges to capturing social value? So hopefully I think there might be a flurry of responses here because it is it can be quite uh, uh, difficult, uh, but it's not impossible. And it's um, I wouldn't say it's rocket science and they are uh, experts already there. You'll hear from them today and um, um, yes, um, um, actually, they can be, and we hope to be able to enable a little bit more building this capability and capacity across uh, public health Wales and across the, the NHS, of course, um, build, depending on our own <laughs> capacity and resources as a small, very small team, as you can see. There's only a couple of people currently. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully. So what are the barriers and challenges to capturing social value? Trying to save money, measuring social value are challenging. Yes, well, but how and why, I suppose, is the question. It's challenging if you maybe go a little bit um, into a detail. Resource, um, resource, I suppose, is this resource for um, evaluation? I mean, uh, obviously, yes, or I can be um, um, added to or inbuilt into a, a mainstream evaluation if this is going, so I suppose, maybe resources for evaluation and adding these on lack of data and evidence. Well, yes, I mean, if we obviously we, um, um, the data, I mean, I'm not gonna comment very much on that, but because obviously you'll see what sort of data the, the, the SRI is building on, um, resource and skills. Yes, like funding for evaluation. Yes, so it's coming clear now. Data collection, reporting, accountability, and transparency. Indeed, proof that it works. Um, pressures, well, as every methodology, I suppose there are uh, pros and cons and limitations. So we'll look into that. Pressures financial efficiency due to current financial situations. Of course, of course, uh, this is. Uh, uh, when uh, um, colleagues, you know, in finance are constrained into um, breaking even at the end of an year, it's only one year, of course, the the, the, the straightforward um, um, financial returns are the first to be looked at. Difficulty getting qualitative data, time cost buying, hard to quantify lack of data, ensure of methodological approach, follow early adopters and champions to have social value. Yes, very good um, thoughts and ideas as well. So. Uh, so we can see maybe half of the people, 47 responses. I can't see anything coming up more, but so maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can move on. Thank you, Anna. Into the next question. Um, so in the face of uh, the current unprecedented pressures on, on the NHS in Wales, um, and why the how can social value approach help drive sustainability, resilience, and population well-being? Uh, so, I mean, if you can think really again from your perspective, a bit more specific rather than the the general sort of um, 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 overview, that would be really helpful to see where we can focus maybe next uh, areas of of work. Um, so, how do you think it can uh, be maybe um, I don't know integrated, added on, or um, um, maybe embedded into something, or I don't know, targeting resources. I can see some emojis. 
a bearing, a piece of slice, and an apple, whatever this means. Informed decision making and prioritization, evidence of long term cost savings, and public health interventions. Yes, this is how it shows how to direct resources to areas that create social value. It can um, hopefully look longer term and benefits rather than acute problems. Definitely. Long term preventive measures, hopefully. That's a very good point. Integrated uh, implementation, traditional economic and complement traditional economic analysis, definitely. Driving more effective procurement across um, boundaries. Indeed, for further embedded uh, message, a message with NHS health boards and trust and prevention for hand for the future. It can help us to get out of the circle of firefighting over the longer term planning and impacts. Hopefully, this is this is what our uh, ambitions and hopes are are targeted. Um, as well uh, at interventions, different points in life can avoid a crisis response. Uh, frank, honest discussions between uh, politicians and public. Yes, healthy people are cheaper people. Helping interventions that are addressing what's important to people. Incorporating green value, cost being environment, very important as well, uh, which uh, can be forgotten sometimes. The increased importance of uh, um, priorities, I didn't get that, but anyway, you're, we can have all of this uh, in one place afterwards. More qualitative data will inform an efficacy of early intervention. Yes, my help sh uh, shift the focus upstream uh, to prevention. Uh, we're very much hoping that this can help doing that. Uh, quick wins from co-coordinated and integrated services. Yes, I mean, there's some already good approaches into thinking in that direction. Uh, keep it coming. Uh, we have been having conversations uh, with different colleagues from across uh, different health boards and also um, partners like third sector organizations interested in, um, in, in that. So um, I think uh, I think um, a lot of colleagues uh, across uh, the NHS are, are on board, but of course it's a challenge to, uh, it does need the resource to um, uh, to embed it and do it um, properly and, and uh, um, uh, regularly as well, well as part of a sort of a, an evaluation, a value of investment into local, yes, local, I suppose, um, organizations, third sector, community resilience, prevention work, sharing information, young children, Need to recognize the impact on future generations and invest in early years, prevention of health problems. Uh, how about not just public health? Yes, definitely. So, of course, public health sits also in uh, uh, local health boards. And, of course, the wider determinants are also linking with local authorities. So, um, it's uh, not necessarily only health boards, but it's also uh, colleagues and uh, uh, relevant practitioners and professionals in local authorities, whether they are environmental or transport or education or social care. Um, so, obviously, using the, uh, hopefully, we can use some of the mechanisms already created and uh, the connections, social value, um, uh, that people are central decision making. Yes, uh, need to. Um, yes, so um, obviously, yes, so it's, uh, public, the pe public peoples and public voice and uh, inclusion into planning and into decision making. Um, uh, learning from what works or not prevention long term. Uh, of course, the chip is not always the best. Uh, the public sector provided public sector leaders through pilot programs. And as Oliver mentioned, this is also taken on board by both, well, largely private organizations. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, not that much public, uh, which uh, we as, um, you know, uh, a public um, a service, um, wider NHS, public health, we're definitely creating a lot of these wider um, social uh, uh, an environmental value and impact, which uh, doesn't really get measured uh, uh, or showcased into sort of financial terms. Links across inequality, sustainability and health, very interesting as well. I think we had quite a few responses already. Uh, future generations coming up. So I don't see anything more coming up. I think we have around 48 night uh, consistent respondents, so that's that's good. 
so we know this going forward yes anna thank you you can go to the next question very thank you for your uh, 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 responses some of them really good um, thoughts and um, directions for future exploration so the next question is what specific indicators or metrics should be prioritized when assessing social value so this goes specifically more into the measurement and i know we have the afternoon session for that um but it's about what you think it's important to um be measured um so this can inform also uh, and of course in wales we have um uh, the well-being and future generations um, act indicators we have the public health outcomes framework but what is it maybe uh more or particularly related to social value uh that we would like and you think are important to be used depending on the inter intervention obviously um, value to the user definitely um it's a difficult question is it um but i suppose from where again where you work um looking from your perspective what is it important that you want to know um depends yes of course it depends <laughs> Well, I suppose it's I know it depends, but is there anything which um, which comes as a maybe priority population health and well-being impact qualitative narrative based measures, people's stories demonstrate impact breakdown of cost qualitative data and value to the target audience outcomes sustainability environmental impact education fair work mental well-being yes very important mental physical health outcomes reducing isolation increasing well-being personal outcomes of a patient and if uh, relevant their family of course alongside societal benefits economic benefits and environmental so of course uh, it's uh, the the pure roi cost benefit analysis don't take account into of the family um or community um so yes so uh, sri looks into a, a sort of a wider um stakeholder or a, or a target i suppose population group measure who was um measure who was impacted by the intervention demographics um can be different population health mental yes as we mentioned environment fair work emissions avoided so it's an environment education labor market outcomes yes are interesting i suppose the business license and the apple mean may be uh the local and sort of a big picture um so it's interesting to see these coming back we need to consider the level of the measurement and additional work involved of course yes so um there is uh of course whether we measure something or not um well uh, the methodology itself focuses on the specific target group or stakeholders so it's um it can be both on a local or a national level individual family specific communities both outcomes such as reduction or blood pressure as well as impact life expectancy gains yes very very good actually uh, so specific sort of um, uh, risk factor may be a reduction as compared to a long term um, health or health life expectancy gain stories and experiences. I mean, we'll be looking um, at Kath and Oliver will be obviously explaining a little bit more that the SORI can be done uh, both prospectively and retrospectively. Uh, so I suppose they are, you know, also uh it's related to that physical mental health employment what's important to people <clears throat> uh, consistency across different interventions that's a very good point as well around maybe um comparability uh, waiting list lengths yes that might be something to consider right rates um of pay and employment fair work poverty food uh allow some flexibility in how it is done waiting times to access services yes this comes again lived experience outcomes in childhood child poverty childhood obesity childhood mental health educational outcomes outcomes are very yeah very important so a lot of very important outcomes coming through um 
uh, from the old, uh, from the audience. I can still, uh, I can still see coming through. Uh, that's good. So both related to qualitative, but some uh, some more hard also outcomes as well. Um, so it's very good to see, and we can uh, we can summarize these afterwards and see what comes up uh, as a priority. I can see Anna. Yes, I think we are probably ready to go to the. Uh, to the next question. I think they are. Uh, yes, so this is the last question. And uh, so again, this session replaces the, the group work, which uh, we are um, a little bit too many, unfortunately, to be able for everyone to, to speak in a, a group of maybe <laughs> 15 or 20 people. Um, so uh, hopefully this um, uh, gives you an opportunity to share your thoughts and um, and views on, on these questions. So this is the last question before our break. How would you use social value to support your work objectives and priorities? So again, please be as specific as possible uh, because we would like um, uh, we would like to um, to get a little bit more from the um, practical uh, practical sort of uh, uh, feel and examples and. Uh, uh, and experiences of how this can be um, implemented or embedded um, and maybe, of course, advocate for for more resources for it. Um, so measuring impact of work less. Um, so I suppose this means less um, fragmentation, maybe, and more integration or more the bigger picture uh, is the apple. <laughs> Um, or maybe more healthy, um, uh, maybe this is more related to the healthy lifestyle, so less pizza, more apples. <laughs> Apology if I'm not getting the, uh, the, the meaning, but this, I suppose, it probably may be more healthy lifestyle and or um, opportunities and healthy environment than, uh, than unhealthy. So that's definitely something uh, we're aiming at, evaluating success. Yes, improve improve commissioning, uh, demonstrate potential impact for future investment, shift to prevention, show the wider value of projects beyond um, the money spent uh, when uh, writing funding proposals, projects on the measurable inputs and outputs. Yes, definitely. So into sort of business cases, assessing the impact of rural urban uh, geographies on service delivery. Yeah, this is one of the priorities also for uh, well-being economy economies and for WHO is around rural proofing, which is very relevant for Wales as well, as we do have these rural areas uh, and uh, areas with high inequality. And uh, uh, so, yeah, this rural proofing is, is coming up as, as one of the um, important priority. Uh, justification for adding uh, um, additional staff, impact on individuals and communities. Uh, resources are being channeled collect correctly, evidence of benefits value, uh, capturing the user voice, mentioned before, very important, assist with prioritizing work, business cases, implementation to assess what outcomes were achieved, uh, demonstrate benefits to Welsh society, start um, seeing spent as potentially being an investment in people, not just a cost or organization, very important. So this is uh, we have been careful using the work investment, the word investment, but this has been where we very much um, want to to be. And I know internationally as well, uh, considering uh, public health and um, uh, prevention uh, and health uh, overall as well as not a black hole, uh, not a black hole for this, you know, just money sinking, sinking into that, but um, but actually um, uh, showcasing. Uh, uh, capturing the importance of human and, and social capital uh, being built and environment, of course, uh, as well, environmental um, outcomes. Strength and justification for reorienting services towards preventing non communicable diseases. Um, definitely a localized program offering a service more in line with the local communities. Yes, definitely needs using social value up, appreciative inquiry, uh, very much so. Um, identifying and assessing wars of high level interventions, policy change system approach. Yes, this is, I think, again, going into more national and system level, of course, is, is ever is more and more difficult. Uh, maybe again, linking with um, uh, and as Oliver's building on the realist evaluation. This can be a useful addition to that. 
um, while on a local level, I think there can be definitely uh, some very good uh, cases um, showcasing uh, the, the value of using these met methodology, social down investment, assisting challenging uh, the eliteness that can be medical models in health. Yes, um, and also co-production, I suppose, with the patient. So yes, definitely ensure that there is an understanding that social value includes social environmental economic impacts. Yes, that's um, that's one of the challenges we are facing because, of course, there's social value, which doesn't necessarily intuitively um, for people includes um, environmental and economic, but by definition it does. So that's why I'm saying I think in Wales uh, we use a lot of terms like public value or well-being impacts, doesn't matter what we call it. Um, we use in our narratives a lot, um, you know, comprehensive value. I mean, it's not exhaustive, but still sort of uh, comprehensive, including both the uh, sort of immediate and hard outcomes, but also our outputs, but also um, outcomes and impacts which are um, softer and more longer term. Breastfeeding, I could see also in the chat, so the community workplaces, commissioning plans, triangulating and getting consensus on interventions between different stakeholders. Yes, very interesting. Educate others in why it's important. Yes, actually, that's a very interesting uh, comment and um, answer um, about um, really showing the importance to um, um, to those who, you know, whether it's um, um, budget holders or whether it's, um, again, practitioners or professionals who work in a specific area and just widening the scope and showcasing that there are other important elements. Public health prevention, challenging uh, influence, how to incorporate into monitoring systems need to make it easier to capture. Well, yes, unfortunately, not everything is easy. So again, <laughs> it's whether we focus on what's easy uh, or what's important to, to measure drive service improvements. Definitely so, that's very, very important responses. Um, brilliant, so I can't see, uh, I can't see any more responses coming. Cultural value, okay, that's very important as well, yes. Uh, culture is uh, obviously a dimension, definitely so. Um, Okay, brilliant. Yes, the cultural dimension of our well-being. Important to include. Okay, I think we'll probably wrap it up here. So you have a proper 10 minute um, for um, uh, a comfort break. So, so without further ado, um, I'll continue uh, with, um, uh, with the masterclass. And uh, we have a couple of summary slides just before I introduce you, Oliver, uh, which uh, interestingly enough, are summarizing or well, they're summarizing from uh, uh, also what Kath, um, uh, uh, some of what Kath took you through this morning, but also nicely su summarizing a lot of the feedback which we had um, uh, during the, uh, the, the Menti session. Uh, so uh, it's around the why measuring value is, is important. Um, and uh, I can see uh, a lot of we are all on the same page. So it is very important. Um, um, for people uh, and placing a uh, high value on uh, living a longer and healthier life and me measuring what matters most to to the people and their communities and uh, their families and, and all uh, relevant and impacted um, stakeholders, whether this is um, maybe staff in education uh, uh, or uh, or health, um, health um, you know, social services staff as well, of course, the people who are delivering some of these um, uh, interventions, uh, uh, as well as the people who are uh, providing and paying for them. Uh, it is important also for organizations moving away uh, from the value for money uh, towards a more comprehensive social or public value uh, and increasing corporate responsibility, uh, of course, in response to also legal um, uh, obligations and to regular regulatory obligations as well. Uh, for funders and investors, whether they're commissioners or whatever budget holders, so we, whether they're health boards or local authorities or, or government, um, uh, hopefully, uh, again, providing a little bit more comprehensive and relevant evidence and uh, data uh, around how they can prioritize these budgets uh, so they can make um, the most difference uh, to where it matter or to where it matters most. 
and um, the next slide um, to governments and global agencies. So this, there is a, a global uh, movement and drive for uh, looking and improving well-being and positioning um, people and populations and, and their well-being in the center of economic development. Uh, as well as uh, uh, the environment and uh, our planetary um, uh, sustainability and how do we um, live in a, a more sustainable and inclusive uh, way and, uh, and we create a more and more fairer society as well. Um, for practitioners and implementers, so as was mentioned from quite a few people around policy or program, um, um, uh, monitoring, measuring impact and improvement. So this relates to the uh, locative efficiency, whether we do the right thing, whether we do the right program, but also to the technical efficiency, uh, doing the, the programs and the services we are doing, uh, the right ones, doing them well. Um, and uh, finally, uh, also, um, it is uh, relevant for researchers and um, economists um, um, improving, uh, ever, ever improving, and the, the methodology to um, make sure um, it's uh, as robust as possible and capturing the, the right things. Obviously, always there will be always limitations to any methodology, as we know, but there are there is quite significant, and I know Oliver will talk about that now, and SRI has been used for more than 10 years now, so it's quite significant um, body of evidence uh, behind that and, um, and behind the methodology itself. So, uh, um, just going into the more um, specific um, uh, um, how do we measure and uh, social value and the social joint investment framework, I would like to introduce um, our uh, now a quite long term uh, colleague and consultant Oliver Kempton, uh, who is a social value expert, is a co-founder of Envoy Partnership, um, uh, uh, which is a social value consultancy and has been supporting public health Wales um, with this work uh, uh, from already since uh, 2018. Um, Oliver also sits on the Social Value UK Advisory Board and the Social Value International Methodology Subcommittee. So, Oli, the, Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mariana. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for being here this afternoon. So I'm going to talk about how we measure social value <clears throat> and in particular, look at the social return on investment framework, and how that works. I'm going to do that over the next 15 minutes or so. If there's any comments or questions as we go, please do drop them in the chat. So what is social return on investment? I won't read everything on here. And some of this has been covered already. And in particular, at the bottom of that slide, that description of social value that Social Value International uses, that's the same one that Kath referenced earlier. So there's a lot of crossover here. I think social return on investment is similar to the concept of social value, but in particular, it's focusing on this value for money question. So an SROI analysis, I'm looking at the text there in bold, an SRO analysis can help an organisation to understand whether a particular project or programme represents value for money. And the way that it does that is by looking at the total benefits that have been created, be they economic, social or environmental, and whichever stakeholders are affected, and compares that with the investment in a programme. And so that helps us to understand not just are we doing good or not, but how much value are we creating? How much is our project or program, how much value is it creating compared to others and compared to how much we spend, what looks like the best value for money option? And so moving on to the next slide, if we can, at its heart, SROI has this ratio, value of the benefits divided by the investment. So you may have come across organisations talking about this, they'll say, for every pound we spend, we create three pounds of social value or something along those lines. And when they're doing that, they're talking about this ratio here, how much outcome and how much value in particular are they creating for those outcomes divided by the investments. But a few things on that, and in particular, how it's different from perhaps a more traditional cost benefit analysis. Firstly, it's an outcomes based evaluation. So within your work, you may well be looking at outcomes and outputs and so on. Within SROI, we're focused on focusing on 
valuing those outcomes, the actual changes that matter to stakeholders. And so sometimes we might be measuring more short term things, but we're still seeking to understand the amount of outcome that they create. Just as an example of that, if we're looking at a vaccination program, then the key indicators might be the number of vaccines administered, for example. But in an SROI context, we wouldn't be putting, saying, well, a vaccination in itself is worth this amount of value. We'd say, what are the outcomes that arise from that, people's health and perhaps other outcomes? What are the values of those? It then measures change, measures outcomes that matter to stakeholders. And that is actually different from some other evaluation approaches, because rather than saying, well, here are our objectives, here are the three, four, five things that we set out to achieve, instead of saying that it's a focus on accountability for our overall impact. So yes, that does include our intended outcomes, but it also includes any unintended outcomes, and they may be positive, but they also may be negative. So that helps us to understand some of the trade-offs that we might have. You might have a particular program that improves people's health, but in other ways, maybe has a slight negative impact on an aspect of their well-being. And you can look at those trade-offs and the value that is being created or, or removed, if you like, um, and understand that broader impact. Finally, it places a monetary value on all of our material outcomes. We'll talk about materiality in just a moment, but what's important here is that all of those outcomes, yes, the economic outcomes, yes, perhaps the resource savings to different parts of the NHS, but also people's health, also people's well-being, also the impact perhaps on friends and relatives of patients that you might be working with. So all of those different outcomes will try and place monetary value on. And what that means is that we can seek to understand this broader value for money by looking at all of those different outcomes, even though they're not measured in the same unit. So we might be comparing apples with pears, for example, but by converting all of these outcomes into a monetary value, it allows us to compare them on the same balance sheet, as it were. And so SRI is governed by a set of principles, and this very much goes back to the accountability and in particular, sorry, the accounting and the sustainability accounting heritage of the SROI approach. There are eight of these principles. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I am going to pick out a couple of them. So number four only includes what's material. I don't know if there's any accountants on the call here today on the meeting, but this is an accountancy approach is recognizing that when you start to look at broader outcomes for broader stakeholders, we could spend all of our time trying to measure absolutely every little thing. And if we do that, we risk wasting resources, essentially. So materiality is a concept that helps us focus on the things that really matter to decision making. So we don't have to try and measure absolutely everything. So perhaps in some cases, an intervention will have an impact on the well-being, perhaps, of friends and relatives of a patient. But it's not very big. It's not very significant. And therefore, we don't need to incorporate that, spend time measuring it and valuing it. Also at the top, principle one involves stakeholders. And that goes back to the earlier point about how we seek to understand all of the outcomes, not just our intended outcomes. And if we're going to understand all of the outcomes, we need to first identify what they are. And involving stakeholders is an important component of that. So moving on then to look, <coughs> excuse me, at the different stages that we'll go through in an SROI. So there are six stages of an SROI. If you just, um, perhaps if we just put them all on the screen, actually, that'd be helpful, sorry. So we'll look at firstly, establishing the scope and identifying who our stakeholders are, and then mapping our outcomes, the different, um, out, the different changes for stakeholders that we see. And generally that process points one and two, there will be largely a qualitative process. So that means that the research that underpins it will involve focus groups and depth interviews, speaking to small numbers of stakeholders, really trying to unpick why um, a particular program leads to outcomes and how perhaps those short term outcomes lead on to longer term outcomes and so on. And then steps three to five are more of a quantitative process. So, so stage three there, evidencing outcomes, that's measuring them, that's quantifying them. So that's where we'll use some of the different measurement tools that we have to hand and then giving them a 
giving them a value. And in an SROI context, that value is a monetary value. It's a monetary figure. Establishing impact, stage four, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is where we think about questions such as what would have happened anyway? How much credit can the program that we're evaluating really take for this chain, these changes that we've seen, these value that's been created? How long do the outcomes actually last into the future? So all of those questions need to be asked as well and quantified, and that allows us at stage five to calculate our SROI and come up with that ratio. That, of course, allows us to report on the value for money um, that we're creating. It also allows us to look at how we can improve the value that we're creating. And you may have noticed on the previous slide, there were eight principles. The final one is be responsive. That's about reacting to responding to the, the findings that we're seeing and saying, well, how can we create, create more value from what we're doing? So I'm going to pull out um, a few particular things that we can focus on to do SROI well. And then after that, I'll show you an example of a calculation for SROI. So three particular things that I think we need to focus on when we're looking at an SROI approach. So firstly, some key consideration considerations when mapping our outcomes. When we're looking at those different outcomes for our different stakeholders, what do we need to take account of? Well, firstly, focus, as we said earlier, on those outcomes rather than the outputs. So that we, we obviously want to understand the outputs as well. And just to be clear there by outputs, I mean the quantification of our activity. How much stuff do we do? Yes, we want to know that. But our outputs might be things like numbers of vaccines administered. We want to know what then changes for stakeholders as a result. What are those outcomes that then arise? Secondly, let's look at the outcomes for those affected indirectly and looking at the responses from the polls that Mariana was putting up. I think some of this is already coming, coming through, but it might be family members. It might be informal carers, for example, of people who are experiencing outcomes, government services. It might be the environment. There might be a carbon emissions impact of what we're doing. So consider outcomes for those affected indirectly. And then one risk, I think, of taking an SROI approach is we can end up double counting and we can end up double counting for a number of reasons, but particularly because our outcomes actually overlap. So when we're talking about, for example, someone's um, mental health and improvements in their mental health, improvements in their well-being, improvements in their self-esteem, improvements in their confidence, are all of those things totally different outcomes or are they actually overlapping a little bit? And if we place a monetary value on each of those outcomes, then are we doing it in such a way that we're actually kind of double counting? So one way to think about this challenge is to focus first on our final outcomes. And those are the ones that are given a monetary value. Those are outcomes that we might say are valuable in their own right. And then also intermediate outcomes, the steps that we get that we that we see to get there and not give those a monetary value to give you an example there it might be that we see um, an increase in exercise for a particular cohort of people and um, because they exercise more their um their ability to kind of to to perform certain exercises improves and then their health improves as well and actually it's the health bit that really matters there the fact that someone exercises more frequently that's not necessarily valuable in its own right. It's valuable because of what it then leads on to. If we take an example from outside of public health. If you're looking at money management, for example, it might be that a money management program leads to people being more motivated to manage their money. It leads to people having better budgeting skills. It leads to people um, ultimately saving money. And that's the final outcome and being less anxious about money. The fact that they are then better at budgeting, we would call that an intermediate outcome and not give it a monetary value in the SROI. So that's the first thing to consider. The second is the importance of subjective measurement. And when we're talking about these broader outcomes, some of these outcomes are things that are inherently subjective and frequently subjective measures are the best ways to measure them. What do we mean by that? We mean when we ask people directly about their own health and well-being and things like that. There's a quote here from Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist, saying research has shown that it's possible to collect meaningful and reliable data on subjective well-being. It should be measured separately to derive a more comprehensive measure of people's quality of life 
and so on. And if we can just click through again, we'll see an example of a well-being measure come up here. You might well not be able to read that very well. This is from the World Health Organization, the WHO5 index. It's an example of a well-being measurement tool where people are asked a number of statements and asked how much those statements apply to them. Things like, I felt cheerful and in good spirits, I felt calm and relaxed, and so on. I imagine many people on this call will be familiar with other metrics like that, perhaps PHQ-9, GAN-7, things at the Warwick Edinburgh scale. There's lots of those kinds of measures. In an SROI context, we can use those to understand people's levels of health and well-being and use that to value those outcomes as well. And then we, placing a monetary value on those outcomes. How on earth would we do that? And I think for a lot of people, this is a real challenge to an SRI approach. How do you place a monetary value on those outcomes? Or even perhaps I'm not really comfortable putting a monetary or financial value on someone's health and well-being. We're not going to dig into today. We haven't got time to talk about are we comfortable doing that or not, but we are going to talk just a little bit about how people might do it. And in the healthcare world, there's a lot of work done on valuing outcomes that we're drawing on in SROI and particularly within the healthcare system, the qualities, quality adjusted life years. I think many of you will be familiar with those. They're a measure of health status and they look at people's quantity of life essentially and quality of life as well. So they help us understand, yes, it's something helping people live longer, but also to what extent is improving their quality of life as well throughout that period. And just over on the next slide, we'll see um, some examples of that from uh, health gains from taking part in sports um, and physical activity. So in this instance, depending on the type of sport taking part and, and what's important there, actually, most of the time is the amount of time they spend playing those different sports and the age of the person participating and in particular, therefore, the, the how long the benefits will last. How much impact does taking part in sports or physical activity have on their health and what's the monetary value of that? And here they're using qualities and they've put a monetary value of £20,000 per quality, which you can see just in that title for the chart there. So this is an example of where we're measuring participation in sport and exercise and we're drawing on other research that maps the health outcomes of that participation and then places a monetary value on that. If you're wondering what, by the way, why golf has got a, such a high value compared to other things on there, it's because people tend to do it for longer. They spend longer playing golf than they do taking part in athletics, for example. Um, so that's why those figures, that's one of the factors, the main factor that affects those figures. And so moving on to the impact questions. So one of the stages of SROI was about um, considering impact. And there's three key considerations here, something called dead weight, sometimes also known as a counterfactual. Neither of those terms are necessarily the most user friendly terms in the world, but essentially there we're looking at what would have happened anyway. And in some cases, that's just trying to find a benchmark or an estimate of um, changes perhaps in well-being of, of a similar group of people. If we're testing pharmaceutical drugs, then we would have a double blind control group to help us understand that uh, in a randomized control trial. In most public health interventions, that kind of approach is impossible. So usually we'll be looking at some kind of benchmarks. I think this is particularly important when we're looking at pre preventative approaches where we're trying to reduce negative outcomes because you might not actually see any change for individuals, but preventing a change is actually a positive impact because this dead weight is that things, you know, people might have fallen more frequently or people's mental health may have deteriorated, for example. I'm not going to talk now about the final one, displacement, but this middle one, attribution, is important. This is an understanding of how much credit we can take for the change, and it's it's being realistic about the contribution of different organisations involved and different partners involved. And I think particularly in this instance for public health, sometimes a public health intervention may act as a catalyst for change. It may be that actually people are um, people are referred on to other services, for example, um, and those other services might take a large amount of credit for the for the outcome, for the values, but it wouldn't have happened without the input of this other service as well. So how does all of this come together? And I'm going to wrap up here by just showing a couple of uh, calculations. And sorry, the, uh, the numbers have moved across uh, a, a little bit, but this is a 
a very rough and ready calculation first off for an increase in someone's well-being and represented in numbers of qualities. Remember, qualities are quality adjusted life years. So it's a proportion of health. So what we have here is working through from left to right. We have the number of stakeholders affected. In this instance, a thousand people. So make the maths a little bit easier. We'll look at the change in well-being. So we've got a well-being pre-measurement and a post-measurement that might have been uh, conducted. Those numbers might have arise, arisen through the WHO5 index that we showed earlier. Those numbers have been converted to a scale that runs from zero to one. So that one would be hitting all the top scores and zero would be hitting all the bottom scores. So they've moved from 0 0.45 before to 0 0.64 afterwards, and that will give us a change in well-being. They've gained a number of qualities through that, 0 0.352. Where does that come from? Well, that's from some research for the Centre for Mental Health that looked at um, the quality impact of changes in well-being and mental health. We're taking a share of the attribution, a share of the credit there, and that gives us a number of qualities created of 33.4 qualities across those 1,000 people. And then on the next slide, it's the same calculation, but this time we look at that in terms of social value. And this is where we put a financial proxy on that. What's the value of those qualities? And here we're using a value of 30,000 pounds per quality per year. Um, and so that's showing us a change as total social value of one million pounds worth of social value per year. And that's the only difference between these two slides. We've now put a monetary value on those outcomes. And I think what that shows really is, I mean, on the previous slide, 33.4 qualities. For a lot of people, that doesn't really mean very much. Probably for some people in school it does, but for others it won't. Whereas a million pounds of social value, I think for a lot of people, we understand what a million pounds is, it kind of makes a lot more sense. And also that allows us perhaps more readily to compare it with different types of programmes, perhaps that aren't focused on people's health, but also compare it to the investment that we put in. Was it worth it or not? How do we arrive at those valuations? Well, that £30,000 is from NICE, National Institute for Health and Care Excellences, cost effectiveness threshold, we won't go into the details, but it essentially comes from nice benchmarks about value for money. And so that starts to show us how we can get to our total social value. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I think I've possibly overrun a little bit. Apologies for that. If you do have any questions, um, I don't know, Marianne, if we've got time for questions now, we'll part that later on. I'll let uh, Marianne take over from here. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Oliver. And yes, if we can leave the questions, because we are running a bit ahead in time, as we had quite a, a spent a bit of more time uh, in the middle with the Q&A and the Menti session. So I'll just uh, hand over to Kath. And if there are any questions, um, or maybe, uh, Oliver, you can see in the chat, I think there are a couple of for you. Maybe you can answer them in the chat, uh, because I think they are relevant for, uh, you know, it's more technical for you. If you can answer them in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, we can answer them after the webinar as well. So, Kath uh, and Anna have now another 20 minutes um, to go through some of the practical applications and hopefully we'll, um, we will be wrapping it up in on time at 3.30. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you, Oliver, for that last session. So the last bit of this um, webinar now will be focusing on some practical applications. So basically the work that we've been doing in the team over the past couple of years to sort of show how we've used what we've learnt and um, what tools we've got for, for you guys to use and have a look at. Um, and yeah, just have, have a bit of a sense of what we've been progressing over our time working on the Social Value Programme. So I'll cover the first example and then I'll hand over to Anna. So I'm going to be talking through, um, we've actually been putting what we've learned into practice by carrying out a first sort of, it's not a pilot, it's a primary study where we've used um, both the lens of health impact assessment framework, which I won't go into detail about today, but some of you on the call might know, in conjunction with um, a social return on investment framework methodology as well. And this was done on a um, specific intervention, which is running in some of our prisons in Wales, um, where it's a sexual health service where um, prisoners are being offered the opportunity to carry out self-sampling, so self-testing for um, chlamydia and gonorrhea, rather than having to be taken off site to a clinic to have the test done, done there. So 
a bit of um, background to the, the study itself. So in May 2020, the test and post service was launched for the general public um, in Wales, where if you wanted to request a sexual health test, this was particularly during COVID, um, you could go online and request for a kit to be sent um, to your house. You could do then the swabbing yourself at home and then return the test kit um, to be tested in the lab via the postal service. But however, prisoners don't have regular access to computers or the internet or postal services. So therefore, an analogue version of the service was set up by a team at Public Health Wales. So this was motivated by one, prisoners not having equitable health care and prisoners were often having to wait about two weeks for appointments at the sexual health clinic because they had to be taken off site. So the aim of our particular study was to provide a service evaluation of this self-sampling, self-test service and measure its social value through the combined lens of health impact assessment and social return on investment. So to just give an overview as well of what this new self-sampling service, how it differed to standard practice, the standard in-clinic test that the, the prisoners were used to receiving. So if you look at the, the right-hand side, we've got the standard practice. So prisoners go to the health wing um, to request an SDI test in prisons. Um, then they wait approximately two weeks for an appointment at the external sexual health clinic. I should note now this is in an open prison setting, so prisoners are allowed off-site for particular reasons. So prisoners were then transported by a taxi to the sexual health clinic, and then the test is carried out by a healthcare worker in that clinic, who then sends the test off to the lab, and then the patients receive the results via a letter if it's negative and then in clinic in the in the, hosp in the prison, sorry, if it's positive. So within the self sampling or the self testing intervention, prisoners do the same thing at the start. So they go to their health wing to request an SDI test. But the difference here then is that the test is or the kit is given immediately to the prisoners, service users to complete their, their own swabs with an instruction leaflet in the privacy of their own cell. And then the prisoners return the completed swabs and test kit to the health wing within 24 hours. And then that's sent off directly to the lab to get the results. So by undertaking a HIA and SROI approach, we were able to identify um, the stakeholder groups which were affected and also a number of outcomes which were resulting directly from the change in service. And we then assigned a proxy um, monetary value to these outcomes, as Oliver's just explained. So the three stakeholder groups that we identified um, for the analysis were one, the service users, so the prisoners themselves. Um, secondly, Her, Her Majesty, or His Majesty's Prison Information Service, or HPPS, and then also the NHS as well. So if I go through the outcomes quickly. So for the service users, we identified four key outcomes that they were experiencing a change for as a result of this self-sampling um, service being offered. So firstly, work days gain. So because they're not having to go off site in a taxi to a sexual health clinic, they don't have to take a day off their work. So they're gaining that outcome. Secondly, um, education and training. So some of the prisoners are, attend education and training courses and they wouldn't have to day, take a day out of that either to go off site to attend a clinic. Um, another outcome was improved well-being. And then finally, um, the autonomy, so the value of being able to do the self-sample test themselves. For the HMPPS, um, the direct financial return of not having to transport prisoners by a taxi was obviously a key outcome. Um, and then for the NHS as well, it was the reduced sexual health clinic costs because obviously they're not having to be shipped off to a sexual health clinic to then have the swabs taken by a healthcare worker. So what did we find? Um, we found for the every pound invested, um, there was a social value created of four pounds and 14 pence. Um, and then we took this further to, to help illustrate where that value had been created. And you can see that we had both monetary, mon monetary returnable value and also some illustrative value. So the monetary monetary returnable value was 32% of all the value that we created. And this is, is down to the, you know, those not, not having to take taxis and also the reduced um, cl in clinic time that the prisoners were using. But key to using SROI is this illustri 
illust I can't get my words out, illustrative value that we've created. And that was actually 68% of that whole final total. Um, and this is mainly because of that well-being and the auto autonomy outcomes that the prisoners were, um, were um, experiencing. So the key takeaways from this study, it's the first study to combine and demonstrate the use of HRI and SROI together and produce that wider measure of value. The study found a positive SROI ratio, despite that there was no actual zero, there was no positive infections of chlamydia or gonorrhea identified during the study period. So that means that we can assume that if positive infections were actually identified through the self-sampling service, the value of this intervention would only increase due to impacts on physical health outcomes. And it's also important to note again that 68% of the value highlighted by this study would not have been identified if a traditional economic method was used to evaluate this intervention because they wouldn't be capturing those wider holistic outcomes that we've talked about today. So this study we are due to, well, we're currently finalising the results and they should be available online towards the end of February. So if you are interested in having a look, then keep an eye out for them um, going live towards the end of February. I think I am now going to pass over to Anna. So we will stop there. Thank you, Kath. Um, yeah, I'm just going to talk uh, you through a couple of um, projects we've undertaken as part of the Social Value Programme of Work. And the first one being that we uh, developed a series of um, evidence scoping reviews, and some of which have been published academically. I'm going to talk about them later. Next slide, please. Um, so the aim of the series of reviews is really to understand the utilisation and also the, the current role of the SOI framework in uh, specifically public health and uh, public health interventions and services and programs and help us uh, really to gain a more holistic uh, picture of the interventions we run and also develop. And lastly, the, the scoping review series um, has helped us and will help us to form research priorities um, in the future as well. Um, we have looked into a variety of public health related topics um, already, such as the life course, mental health and physical activity, and those have been academically published um, as well, so you can access them um, through our website, but we also have looked into housing and social prescribing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the first um, scoping review I'm going to um, introduce you to um, is the one on the life course. And the aim there was really to map out the existing SRI, but also the social cost benefits um, evidence on the social value of public health interventions across the stages um, of the life course. And the review covered uh, the stages from birth up into um, to older editor to really understand which public health interventions that target um, certain population um, ages um, produce a high rate of return for both the health um, of the public but also the financial benefits um, to the economy. And what we found is um, that um, around 45 studies um, that's that's the amount. Sorry, that's the amount we identified uh, through the search. All of them showed a, posit showed a positive social return on investment, um, and the evidence review can really be used as a starting point uh, by public health professionals, but also institutions that are looking beyond those traditional um, economic um, measures. Um, next slide, please. Um, the next um, public health topic we looked into um, was around um, mental health. Um, and interventions that address uh, mental health. And um, I think especially because mental health problems being one of the, the leading causes of ill health and disability uh, worldwide, it was really timely and important to, to undertake the review and really understand the wider value of interventions uh, that target uh, mental health. And by aiming to reduce the prevalence, but also the impact of mental health problems on the population, interventions targeted at, at mental health outcomes can really produce um, a high rate of tangible and non-tangible returns um, for a range of stakeholders, and we really wanted to explore that and understand the evidence base um, around it. Um, in total, as part of this uh, scoping review, we identified 42 relevant studies. Um, for example, one of the cat categories we identified was um, um, with 24 eligible studies in total about interventions that were targeted at the general population rather than at a specific um, age group, for example, or um, a certain category of the of the life course. 
Um, and there, the SRI ratio we found was um, between 2.75 to 14.5 for, for every one pound in, uh, invested. So that was uh, interventions related um, and targeted at, at the at the whole population. And findings really indicated um, that the application of, of the SRI framework to evaluate those wider social benefits of mental health interventions could be yeah, really useful just to, to, to inform us further. And that really helped us to, to build um, the evidence um, for public health, uh, evidence base for public health. Um, the next um, scoping study we, was we conducted was on physical activity and nutrition um, interventions, um, which aim to increase levels of physical activity and improve levels of, um, of nutrition. So we know that you know active societies gener generally generate additional value apart from you know positive health outcomes. And in order to understand that a little bit further, we identified we conducted the review and identified the interventions that have a wider impact. Um, so what we found out um, is that around 21 relevant studies um, fitted into um, our exclusion criteria, all of which presented a positive um, SOI ratio. Um, 18 studies um, involved in the inter uh, in involved in the interventions associated with the physical activity um, reported SOI ratios um, between 1.91 to 22.37 pound for every one pound invested. So you can see there's a quite quite a wide range of um, ratios. Um, we found that so the scoping review again identified a range of outcomes associated with the interventions and as previously mentioned by some of the speakers um, SRI is, uh, the SRI framework is really used to to understand the wider benefits so part of it is obviously understanding the the right range of outcomes and some of the outcomes we identified as part of the this scoping review were, were for example educational performance uh, but also reduced isolation so that's a variety of outcomes um, we identified, not just uh, in relation to um, increasing physical activity, for example, um, and improving uh, nutrition. And really, the nature of these these scoping reviews we conducted shows uh, shows us that it has become really, really important that the holistic impact of public health interventions and program is understood, so that interventions that have the greatest value to people can be developed and implemented and financed um, further. So those three um, scoping reviews I just mentioned have all been academically published, so you can um, access it through our website um, if you're interested in. Um, and uh, the next um, project I want to talk talk to you about is the social value database, and that's actually very much linked to the scoping reviews I just briefly um, mentioned. So um, we launched the social value database, or SVDS for short, um, back in 2022. Um, and is, it is the tool that enable us to, uh, enables us to store, present, um, and to a certain extent also manipulate um, SRI data to support prioritization and investment decision making. And it consists of um, a live database of available and relevant SRI evidence, um, which, which came actually from the uh, scoping reviews I just uh, mentioned. And the second part is this interactive tool, which allows us to create simulated studies. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, the database was informed by evidence extracted from the scoping reviews of existing SRI evidence. Um, currently, the SVDS, um, so the database, stores information from interventions related to um, early years, mental health, nutrition, and physical activity, but also work on social prescribing. Um, studies were quality ensured, and study data from relevant studies extracted into the database. Um, around study level information, but we ha also have um, extracted information around um, the economic information and uh, obviously the SRI and analysis um, data fields. The database currently stores uh, around, I think, 76 studies, so it's quite a comprehensive database um, showing various studies um, and their outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, in summary, the um, and apologies if that's a little small on your screen now, but in summary, the majority of SRI related public health interventions derived uh, with most of them related to mental health. Actually, that I think that accounts for around 49 of them, followed by healthy communities related ones, which I think is around 25. Um, the table indicates the type of inter public health intervention of the, and the number of studies we identified in relation to this. Um, you can see this also presented um, in the graph. Next slide, please. 
Um, in total, so, uh, in total from these uh, over 76 uh, studies, which are currently um, in the database, we extracted over a thousand outcomes from the included studies, which which I think is is uh, quite quite comprehensive already, all of which are now presented and stored in the database. 28% um, of all the outcomes are classified as mental health and well-being related outcomes. Um, and you can also hopefully see that a little bit um, in the graph presented on the slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, in regards to outcome relation methods, um, and I think Oliver touched on it that earlier, or maybe Kath, um, in regards to the outcome evaluation methods, um, over 30% of outcomes are valued using a unit cost proxy. Um, around 23% of outcomes are valued uh, using a market value proxy, uh, and only 10% of outcomes are valued um, using a proxy um, from the hacked proxy, um, proxy bank. Um, next slide, please, Kat. Um, and I appreciate this slide might be a very small, but it basically shows the evaluation breakdown I just uh, mentioned earlier, just in a um, in a designed um, way, indicating the type of outcomes such as mental health, uh, physical activity, government resources, savings, and so on, mapped against which uh, evaluation um, has been applied. Next slide, please, Karen. Um, so, um, uh, also apologies to mention, so if you would like to access the database, uh, please feel free to drop us a message and then chat um, or email us um, and we are happy to grant you access and give you login details so you can have a look at the at the data in the, at the tool itself. Um, so the next um, project um, I would like to introduce you to was, um, is called the Footprint Analysis, or also the uh, NHS Contribution to the Welsh um, Economy. It's a piece of work that tries to understand the NHS contribution to the Welsh economy, as I just said, and aims to quantify the contribution of the healthcare sector, so the NHS in particular, to the wider economy in Wales. Next slide, please. The study we undertook looked at the economic output, population income, valued added imports and employment, and it really um, tried to provide an empirical evidence to help build an economy that is based on principles of fair work and sustainability. Um, the methodology we used um, is as follows. The anal analysis um, relies on an input output table, as I mentioned earlier, which show the interdependency between different sectors um, of the economy in Wales. For example, the healthcare sector will rely, 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 rely on purchasing goods and services um, for many other sectors. So, for example, um, hospitals, uh, they require power, water and food supplies. Um, uh, NHS employees require uniform, um, uniforms, ambulances need to be maintained and fueled. So all these kind of things um, were part um, of these input output tables. Um, next slide, please. Um, the analysis can help to strengthen, first of all, the role of the healthcare sector in the foundational economy in Wales, and it informs decision making and budget allocation towards uh, towards it and provides um, an opportunity to really support procurement, employment, um, supply chains um, and service provision towards enhancing NHS, uh, NHS's role as an anchor institution um, at a local level. And what our findings indicate, and we split them in three um, key messages, is that the NHS in Wales is one of the most uh, significant economic sectors. Um, and a powerful stabilizer and investment multiplier rather than in an economic drain as it's often been seen. The NHS in Wales plays an increasingly important role in generating sustainable development um, by ensuring high quality employment and responsible and sustainable purchasing procurement of goods and services. And uh, the third key message uh, was around increased spending in the NHS benefits local economies, such as procuring local suppliers, so for example, uh, food and estate management um, and job uh, creation. And overall, um, output of the Welsh economy would increase by 2.4.7 um, above average for each additional pound spent um, in the Welsh NHS uh, sector. Um, I think that's it for me, Kath. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anna and Kath. Uh, that's been uh, quite, uh, uh, well, a whistle stop really <laughs> through everything we, we have been doing. I hope it has been uh, interesting and useful um, uh, for um, uh, for you. Um, we don't have much time. I was been, I've been monitoring and the colleagues from Public Health um, 
uh, from from the network. Um, so we can't see any questions which we haven't been which haven't been answered. But if there are any, please do um, uh, send us. We can we are happy to um, to answer after the the webinar. Um, so a big thanks uh, to Kath and Anna and Oliver um, for uh, providing this um, uh, um, a whistle stop, but a very uh, still comprehensive um, overview of the social value approach uh, and the social return investment methodology. Uh, and hopefully this has been interesting and useful and uh, we are very happy to uh, follow up and have how potentially uh, well, this can be applied in uh, uh, your work. Um, also, um, uh, colleagues have um, uh, pasted, so you know, have uh, 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 included in the chat the link to a short uh, evaluation. So we'll be grateful if everyone uh, joining the webinar could complete the short evaluation and it will be also sent uh, by email. Uh, and also you're welcome to join the Public Health Network Cymru if you're not already a member. And finally, if you have any thoughts about uh, any future webinar topics, please do um, let the team uh, know. Uh, I think um, uh, we are uh, now at the end. So unless there is anything burning from colleagues from the Public Health Network or my colleagues, I think I'll close um, the masterclass here and we're very much looking forward to continuing working um, and linking with yourselves um, and trying to progress this um, um, area uh, more as we definitely see uh, benefit and um, uh, also support to uh, the sort of a wider legislation and uh, uh, regulatory context, uh, but also uh, also for the benefit of the uh, health and well-being of the population in, in Wales. Thank you all for your participation and uh, have a lovely rest of the day.